Let's talk about Jeremy Snyder's arguments against price gouging. He argues that price gouging is immoral. Now, you could take this as obvious since gouging suggests already something that is unfair, unjust, unreasonable. And that is the way it's often defined. But there is real substance to Snyder's argument. Let's return to our definition of price gouging. It occurs when an emergency causes sudden or sharp price increases, specifically on necessary goods. And there's something about that situation that is unreasonable, unconscionable, unfair, really unjust is the key point. So the question is really, under what circumstances is a price increase, a sudden price increase in response to an emergency on necessary goods unjust? And Snyder says, well, quite frequently, and he gives us a criterion for determining under what circumstances it's unjust. Now, I've already said that since we're dealing here with the question of justice, we've got to be mobilizing some kind of conception of justice. So think about the underlying model of justice. Since we're talking about a sudden or sharp price increase on necessary or essential goods, we must think that's unjust if people have a right to access those necessary or essential goods. So in order for this to be unjust, there must be such a right. It must follow that our model of justice, whatever that is, is going to have to say something about access to these necessary goods. So the model of justice is going to have to say there is some kind of right to access if this sort of price increase is to turn out to be unjust. Well, we're going to have to say under what circumstances, presumably a very slight price increase doesn't count, and so these do have to be sharp, sudden, and it's got to violate in some way some people's rights. So people have to have a right to access these. Well, of course, if prices are being raised sharply, they could still access them if they pay the price. So there must be something about a right to access that is violated by such a sudden or sharp price increase. And what Snyder does is give us a criterion for that. He says, it's true. People do have a right to access these basic, these necessary, these essential goods, these things that are necessary for basic human functioning. And raising prices beyond a certain level deprives people of that access, and so in that way violates their rights. Now, is it true for just anyone? No, he says, it's specifically the poor. Because if we think about these price increases, yes, they limit access. In a way, that's the point of them, because we've got a radical disconnect now between supply and demand. And so the increase in price is meant to reduce demand to the point where there is supply. Well, but what happens? Now, you and I may say, oh, I really wish I had blah, 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 blah. Let's say, to take an example discussed in one of the papers, it's a question of ice after a natural disaster where everything in the freezer is going to spoil, right? Everything in the refrigerator is going to spoil unless people get access to ice. And so there's a strong desire for that. It becomes a highly desirable commodity. On the other hand, is it essential to human life? Well, people still live in many parts of the world where there is no reliable access to ice or refrigeration or anything of that sort. So it's not, strictly speaking, necessary. On the other hand, it's highly valuable in such circumstances. And so you might say, well, okay, let's assume that's included among these essential goods, essential for basic human functioning in a situation where, look, it's hard to access food supplies. It's important to be able to use the food you have at home. And you're not going to be do that, able to do that if it all spoils, etc. So maybe we can include ice in this category, but the sudden price increase, well, you and I may say, ah, I'm not going to pay that. I mean, I don't have that much in my refrigerator. I'll let it spoil. However, you and I are making a decision when we do that. Maybe some people can't make the decision because they can't afford the price. So he says, it's not just a general right to access this at any price I want to pay, for example. He's worried about the fact that the price increase may be so sudden, so sharp, that it just eliminates access for certain people because they can't afford to pay the price. And so it's not a question of choice for them, 
they no longer have a choice because they can't afford it. So he's worried specifically about the right to access for people who are poor, people who are in a position where they cannot afford the price increase. So that's the problem, really. Can you afford the price increase? If you can afford it, but you choose not to, well, okay, that's on you. But if you can't afford it, he says, that's now on the seller. The person who has raised prices to the point where you can't afford it anymore. He says, that's what makes it unjust. That's unfair. Well, let's talk a bit about that underlying model of justice. We have to think there is such a right to access. There are two ways in which you might think about a right to access goods that are essential to basic human functioning. What are they? First of all, philosophers talk about a general right. They also talk sometimes about positive rights. Positive rights are also known as entitlements. A general right is a right to non-interference. So for example, we talk about people having a right to life. What do we mean? We mean that people should not kill them, that people should not deprive them of this. They shouldn't interfere with living. The same thing is true for rights to freedom of speech, for example. People should not interfere with my speaking, prevent me from speaking. That's not to say they have to enable me to speak, they don't have to listen to me and so on, but they have to let me speak. The same thing is true with a right to practice my religion, let's say. They have to let me practice my religion. Now, they don't have to help me or enable me if I say, well, yes, so start buying me Bibles and hymnals and blah, blah, blah. No, they don't have to do that, but they have to let me do my thing. And so a general right is a right to non-interference. So one thing we can say is that people have a right to access necessary goods. They shouldn't be interfered with, okay? People should not stop them. But now the other kind of right is one that is positive. It requires that other people do things for you. This requires that people not do things to you. This requires that people do things for you. So. There, it's like, wait, I have a right to access these basic goods. People have to provide that for me. They have to provide access. They have to enable me to be able to afford those goods. And so this sort of sense of that right to access basic goods is one that's going to imply, for example, the existence of a welfare system or other kinds of aid to help the poor get what is necessary to basic human functioning. That is beyond just saying you shouldn't interfere you should actually help. Now, Snyder thinks there are both kinds of rights with respect to this. Yes, you should not interfere with access to basic goods, but also you should enable people to have that access. There is a positive right, he thinks, as well as a general right. Now, why would he think that's true? His ground is related to that advanced by Immanuel Kant. He says, people have a right to be treated as ends in themselves, not merely as means. And that means, first of all, that I should be allowed to pursue my own ends without interference. And so as long as I'm not harming anybody else or depriving somebody else of their rights, treating them as a mere means and so on, I should be allowed to pursue my good as I see fit. So I should not be interfered with. I should not be interfered with in my pursuit of necessary or essential goods. So non-interference is something that he thinks follows very directly. But Kant also thinks that I have a positive obligation to help other people. It's part of his account of imperfect obligations, obligations to be charitable. Now, as Kant frames it, there is such an obligation. On the other hand, there isn't really a right necessarily in that other person. So what he would say, I think, is uh, there's not exactly an entitlement to basic goods here. Nevertheless, it ought to be the case that people provide the poor with access to those necessary or essential goods. Well, whether you think of this as a right or something weaker than a right, nevertheless a moral obligation to provide these things, even if there is no entitlement, however you think about that, you're going to get the consequence that we should actually enable the poor to have access to these goods. We could say the person who is raising prices suddenly and sharply in response to this emergency on necessary goods is somebody who is interfering with the access the poor would have to this. 
certain people are not going to be able to afford these goods anymore. And that is an interference with their access. So you could try, on the basis of that kind of general right to non-interference, to say, I'm sorry, this is unfair, you've just priced certain people out of the market. And when we're talking about goods that are essential for basic human functioning, that is unjust. The other way to do it is to talk about a positive right, an entitlement, or at least a moral obligation to be charitable and to provide these basic kinds of goods, these necessary or essential goods, to people who could not otherwise afford them. In that case, you could say that the person who raises prices enough that those people cannot afford it is disabling them from being able to obtain those goods. Now, it might be that someone else then enables them, but the most direct person who could enable them to have access to the goods is the seller. And so the seller should not raise prices enough that certain people are simply priced out of the market altogether. Now, I think this is actually a rather tricky matter because let's take the example of ice being brought to North Carolina in response to a hurricane. Yes, it becomes a very valuable commodity. So these people come in and sell a bag of ice for $12, one that you could normally get for a dollar, maybe $2 at a store. Well, is that unjust? Now, it's not that easy to say certain people are priced out of the market. A lot of people are going to look at $12 a bag and think, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, to protect the food that's in my refrigerator and or freezer, I need several bags of this. Wow, so several bags, let's say I need four bags, that's gonna run me $48. Do I really have $48 worth of food and is it gonna succeed in saving it anyway? I'm probably gonna to have to get this ice again tomorrow or the next day. And Wow, this could run me several hundred dollars to save the food that I've got. Is it worth it? They might decide it's not. But Snyder isn't worried about that. He's worried about the person who says, I, I don't have $12. But here's the problem. How many people are just not going to have $12 in response to that disaster? Maybe some, sure. But the main problem is going to be that people who have very little are going to say, look, I, I have other things that I need. I can't, I can't afford to spend that on ice. I need to use that for this thing or that thing. And so one way to look at this is to say, there's a certain collection of necessary or essential goods that are going to be highly valuable in response to this emergency. And probably no one price increase is going to just be impossible for a person who has very little money. However, it may well be that taken together, it is impossible for them to afford the things that now have risen in price very sharply and very suddenly. Here's why I think that's an interesting point to make that Snyder doesn't quite make. It's not as if any one seller is preventing someone from getting access to that particular good. The poor person could spend the money on the ice or could spend the money on the food or that bottle of clean water when clean water is very hard to come by in the wake of the disaster. The problem is they can't afford all of them. And so they have to pick and choose. Now, the reason I think that's an important point to make is that it's not easy to isolate one economic transaction and say, that seller is depriving that buyer. That buyer can't possibly afford what the seller is selling that item for. Probably they could, it's just that then they couldn't afford other things. And every single good is like that. So really, it's a subtler problem than just A, preventing B, from having access to a necessary good. It's really that that collection of sellers now is preventing the person from having access to the collection of things that they need. And so no one person is guilty of preventing or failing to provide access, but taken together they are. So I think we should amend Snyder's account a little bit and point out that it's really not so much directly preventing access or failing to enable access, depending on how we think about this, it's a matter of being part of a group of sellers whose actions taken together deprive that person of the full body 
of goods that are necessary and essential to basic human functioning in that context. So it's not as if we can say anyone is preventing that person. It's really that person is participating in this group that is doing it. And with that emendation, it makes sense to argue this, I think, either from a general point of view or from that stronger positive entitlement point of view. I say stronger because the claim that somebody has a positive right does feel stronger than the claim that they simply should not be interfered with. But actually, you might say it's, a, it's an easier case to make that people have this kind of right and that people raising prices beyond a certain level are actually depriving people of access. So we could go on the basis of that weaker premise, which makes it, if you will, a stronger argument. The problem, Snyder says, is one of equity. The poor are already the least advantaged in this community, and now the full brunt of the natural disaster falls on them. He says that's unfair. We have to find ways of trying to help the poor deal with this disaster. Everybody's going to have a hard time, but they're going to have the hardest time. So what can we do? One thing we can do is, by law, to limit price increases, and he proposes ways of doing that. He says prices should not be able to increase beyond the expectations of cost. Now, that's tricky, and we'll talk more about that problem, but that's the first thing. Secondly, he says, we should impose caps on purchases. I shouldn't be allowed to buy a bunch of bags of ice. I should be limited, let's say, to one or two bags. And the same thing might be true for gasoline, for food, for water, and so on. We should limit people's access, put caps on, so that a few people cannot dominate the market, to try to spread the goods as widely as possible. It may be that there's not enough to go around to everybody who would like this, but, or even for everybody who would need it. Still, we want the distribution to be as wide as possible. In cases where there really just isn't enough to go around, the safest thing to do, the fairest thing to do, would be to have a lottery or to have people have vouchers. That has happened, for example, in wartime, where various goods are rationed. Happened during World War II in the United States, for example. But usually, in response to a natural disaster, things happen suddenly enough that there simply is no time to adopt a lottery or voucher system. In that case, he says, the best thing you can do is limit price increases and have limits so that people can only purchase one or two of an item to make sure they're distributed as widely as possible.